So I came here for Red Hat Summit and interestingly I found that you know, Todd, he founded Purism. He also lives in San Francisco, so I like it's a great idea to just, you know, meet up with him. So today we are meeting Todd. Todd, nice to be, you know, <laughs> meeting you in person. We have been kind of interacting over emails and we had a long, more than one hour long chat yeah, over yes. phone. I, I met Richard Stallman last week uh -huh. and we had a lot of discussions and one discussion was about uh, mostly when you see that we are living in an age where uh, we are surrounded by IoT devices, right? I mean, just yes. look at the kind of uh, marvel of technology that we have at disposal. But sadly, it's uh, it's kind of a threat to our freedom, to our privacy, to, to actually our society, right? At one hand, you have all this amazing, beautiful technology, but at the yes. same time, it's also kind of, it can destroy your life. That's, yeah, sure. So we're discussing that, is it possible to, to, to have a balance between, you know, technologies and business models. Mm -hmm. Is it possible that those companies who do pure open source, maybe they are more ethical than those who do, commer you know, not commercial, but proprietary software. Mm -hmm. So, you know, your name came up. Yeah. So, so can you tell us about, uh, sorry, it's a long, you know, to build the foundation, what I'm asking about. There's a lot to it, yeah, that yeah. makes sense. Mm -hmm. so, so can you tell us about, you know, how, how, what kind of business are you trying to build there? Yeah, so you, you, you touched on a bunch of things, which um, actually it's great because the systemic difference between Purism as a social purpose corporation and all of the other corporations you'd see, C corporations, that we actually have a social purpose first. And what this highlights is solving, you know, paving the way to solve the topic you're bringing up of IoT devices. So my belief is that uh, IoT devices, and you also can look at uh, smart cars, right, all the way to um, self-driving cars or you know any of these advancements that, that society is making my approach is that all of those advancements are great we should just do them all ethically right and so that's a, a, a clear line of bifurcation for existing companies have to drive for maximizing shareholder value which means that given a choice between gathering up more data on an individual because that means more advertising dollars or more information that they can exploit the user for, that we as a social purpose corporation can, can go to the opposite end of that extreme and say we can still advance and create amazing technology, but we're going to do so entirely ethically. So that means that when we can, we can point the finger at Google and Facebook and Apple and Microsoft, et cetera, and all of them are C corporations where they're, they have to, they have a fiduciary duty to maximize shareholder value. So for us, by having that systemic change, then we have a strong belief system behind what we're doing, and then we can create uh, more and more products that actually respect individuals. So when you're talking about IoT devices, which is an area Pearson plans to get into in the future, that we'll be able to create security cameras that the user is in control and the network is completely secured. So the device is secured, the network is secured, and the user has the keys to that, uh, to that network and device. And that, uh, that single simple change is actually comes down to we care about users' rights first and foremost, as opposed to uh, trying to say you must have a centralized server that you log into or you pay a subscription for your camera feed. So uh, it's an important distinction because it is uh, the nucleus of change. So when you were talking about uh, with Richard Stallman from Free Software Foundation, that you know uh, he's had 30 some odd years of being right on the trends of, of uh, where the direction of technology and the issues are coming up. And one of the things that Purism has done is adopted a number of those philosophies and applied those to security, privacy, and freedom. And so by applying those to those uh, pillars, then we can actually solve a lot of these topics that the Free Software Foundation raises as concerns because we're coming at it from a different uh, perspective. You, you talked about that you will be getting into IoT devices as well mm -hmm. at some point of time. Why is it that you know existing IoT devices, or uh, is it is it because of the business model, or it is about technology that uh, you may, like you said, you know, the users will have control, you will have the keys. Mm -hmm. So what is the reason that it, the, the current IoT is like, uh, as they say, the S in IoT stands for security. Mm -hmm. You know, there should be a P also for privacy. Yeah. You know, the P in IoT stands for privacy. Mm -hmm. How can it be achieved and why is it that the current, you know, breed of IoT devices don't offer that? Oh boy, there's, uh, so there's a lot of reasons. And so I'll kind of 
generalize because at any given right. company could Have fall a into a few of those and not all of them. So right. the generalization is that uh, it's a race to market. So you're having a specific, let's say, niche that you're targeting. Uh, be let's say just take security cameras as an mm -hmm. example. Um, and so what you're trying to do is penetrate the market and get market share and potentially, you know, if you're going after investment to then, right. And so each of those cases, you're striving for, right, getting your product to market. So you're not going to care about security as much. You're going to say, I, you know, we just got to get to market. We got to start selling. So the motivating factor behind all of them typically is to uh, sell more product. A lot of it comes with additional services that you need to lock yourself into, signing terms of services that individuals might want, not want to agree with long term. And so uh, there's, uh, I feel like it's um, a lot of scrambling mm -hmm. uh, going on and all of the scrambling you lose on privacy protection right. and security mm -hmm. because the first and foremost is sell product, make revenue, right, maximize shareholder value. And so if you had, uh, let's say a, a, an organization had enough funds, then it gets to, okay, well, I can, they could maybe make a secure device, right, uh, meaning utilize uh, network security at the bare minimum, mm -hmm. but then they're still going to look to saying, oh, but we can, you know, extract a little extra value by, uh, you know, uh, causing harm to the individual's privacy. Right. And so by purism stepping into that space, and we're not going to be doing this in, in 2018 or mm -hmm. 2019, maybe it was the first year we we're going to start looking right. into that. A lot of it to do with our phone coming out that we're putting a lot of effort in right, right now. Uh, but when we enter into the IoT space, we will be coming at it from a different perspective. And so we'll be able to have the funds, we'll be able to have enough of the focus on security, and we also care about the individuals itself. Mm -hmm. So the products that we will put out will be thought as, hey, it gives you peace of mind because you're the one protected and you're the one in control. And that peace of mind story is, uh, is resonates really well with uh, an awful lot of, of people because they can look at, put yourself in the shoes of a of somebody who's looking to go buy a security camera. Mm -hmm. You would see a security camera that's, you know, from uh, Google. Right. And then you see a security camera from Purism who respects your rights. That if all other things are equal, you would choose a security camera that respects your rights. Mm -hmm. um, now, all the other things have to be equal to make that decision because you'd have to get to the point of saying, hey, this is, I want to go with ethical. Right. Which comes down to ease of use, right. convenience, which is a huge thing that we push for. Mm -hmm. You said you know that if there is an option, you will choose you know the one which is kind of respect your privacy. But when you look at Facebook, mm -hmm. like almost every American is a Facebook user and mm -hmm. log into Facebook, and everybody knows that Facebook is basically harvesting everything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And but still they make the choice. If you right. walk into any store, people are willing to give their home address, their phone number, just to get one percent discount. Correct. So I don't, I mean, how do you see that same people will make a conscious decision about choosing a phone that respects their privacy mm -hmm. when they are willing to log into Facebook? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. And the, the difference is the precursor to that, which is if all other things were equal. And primarily that's around ease of use, mm -hmm. right? So if there were an alternative to Facebook that was just as easy to use and had a billion users of your friends, and you could just say, oh good, the water's warm, I could choose between Facebook or the same exact equal version that's ethical, of course they would choose ethical. The, the reason that uh, the uh, free alternatives, let's say the ethical alternatives to Facebook uh, um, will see a challenge is because of the marketing spend of Facebook in the early days and the early adoption and also the, the when they were starting out, the pendulum, overall society pendulum was so far to the right mm -hmm. of digital rights you know, being stripped and completely non-existent so people were signing up like crazy mm -hmm. so what we'll start to see is more of that pendulum swinging back to middle right and as we start seeing it swinging it back to the middle then people are going to be made aware like oh i'm you know what i could sign up for a service i don't have to uh you know completely give up all of my uh, photos and everything that i have historically and i'm locked into that and the terms of service are terrible so uh so your example is really valid because it's highlighting that big corporations uh, with a lot of money will be able to outmarket the small incumbents. And so one of the things that as purism we have in what I consider the ideal business model is that we have a business model that has revenue so we have leverage and we can gain leverage. Gaining leverage allows us, us to influence positive change upstream. Mm -hmm. So be that upstream into the supply chain for hardware 
or be that upstream into uh, services where we can start to get it. So as an example, when you're bringing up the phone or IoT devices down the line, that we can actually push, because we'll have leverage, we'll be selling hardware, and we'll utilize the margin from the hardware to release all of the software under free software licenses. And then we can advance the overall digital rights and have a product that can compete. So today, in the phone market, there is no option. Right? Mm -hmm. You're either on the you know, Apple's iOS walled garden, or you're into the, you're utilizing Android. So what we're doing on the phone is we're putting out a phone that is a completely different hardware stack that allows us to run completely free software, Linux kernel and the GNU OS. And what we get on top of that is the ability for an individual to say, hey, you know what, I can have a choice now. Mm -hmm. And our choice day one, right, we're only talking about encrypted communication, right? So being able to make a phone call, SMS messaging, uh, web browser, email, right, from that device, then apps will continue to grow. But by creating a really core, strong offering that can expand, then we can actually influence change and, and start to disrupt the giants. Canonical tried that and they did not succeed. They had like money and influence and resources. Do you think that you can really break the duopoly of Apple? And uh, I can clearly see uh, that there is a market for people uh, who are researchers or security experts, you know, or, yes. or you know, um, even lawyers, you know, uh, act, activists. There, sure. there, there's a big market for all those uh, people who do want it. But so, are, is that the market you're targeting, or you're looking at, you know, average users? So we are looking at average users. However, mm -hmm. uh, we know that the business model that we put together mm -hmm. was really targeting the nucleus of the core, which are the examples you gave. Mm -hmm. And then already we've already expanded to the core with our laptop sales. Mm -hmm. and the phone interest is already to that. Okay. And so what you can think about is it's forming a strong beachhead and then expanding. And so we've already seen some expansion, but not, you know, not uh, significant. So mm -hmm. we have the core audience, which can still grow, and that's already millions strong. Right. right? Then we can see that that growth. So when you bring up your introduction to that question was Canonical, uh, quote unquote, tried it. So Canonical uh, did uh, work on the Ubuntu Edge phone and then of course Ubuntu Touch. The There's a couple key differences, right, was the timing. Uh, the other piece is that what they were actually looking to accomplish was really Ubuntu on a phone. Right. As opposed to, let's say, the three pillars that we stand behind and then also uh, by us being a social purpose corporation is something right. that really drives the belief system and what we're trying to do. We're trying to change the future. We're not just trying to put out a you know a internal yeah. based phone. That was more about you know being able to use Ubuntu and the oh, terminal sure. on your phone. It yes, was not about right. uh, focus on privacy and security yes. and uh, more control over your own device if you if you want it. Sure. Right. And then the other piece, of course, is that while they did run a, a crowdfunding campaign. I believe it was about $32 million asked and right. they raised maybe $12 million, uh, that that was seen as like not enough to execute. And at that time, uh, it was probably, you know, the, the maybe the right amount. It was a lot more expensive to do fabrication mm -hmm. uh, at that time when that campaign was out. So for us, we have the ability to do all of it and more with a lot less money. Mm -hmm. A lot of that's cash management, uh, making sure that we can execute appropriately. Um, but it's also that it's our core, what we believe in, right? right? So, you know, uh, Canonical historically hasn't done hardware. And Purism does hardware and software. Mm -hmm. And so by bundling that together, that gets it to where, you know, we are entirely focused on it. Right. right? It's not going to be something that in next quarter, I'll look at the line item and say it's not going to happen, right? Um, so it's, we're, we're very, very excited about, you know, how we can influence that change. So, so when you say hardware, are you because I, uh, most of the time what happens is that people take it from the Chinese vendors, mm -hmm. rebrand them, mm -hmm. or do, or do you really design your hardware? How does it work? So it's a so it's a split. So mm -hmm. and part of that process is sort of um, initially mm -hmm. we went to uh, existing um, uh, ODMs mm -hmm. for our laptop, and so in that case we can source certain component parts. Right. So these are called what's called public molds. Mm -hmm. So like our case is from a public mold. And that allows us to save an awful lot of, of money up front on tooling costs. Right. right. Because these are very expensive very tooling. Expensive, yeah. And so we can, so we did a combination mm -hmm. of ex using, utilizing existing public molds and then modifying them to our needs, such mm -hmm. as anodizing it black, right. adding some uh, after tooling, mm -hmm. adding some uh, 
cutouts for hardware kill switches. Mm -hmm. And then we also, um, you know, reprinted the keycaps. Mm -hmm. So that was a design change. So we have a, a full list of what we source versus what we modify versus what we manufacture entirely. Uh, that's for the laptops. So as an example, the motherboard is a Intel reference design mm -hmm. that we then modify to our needs, adding hardware kill switches, rerouting certain components, adding mm -hmm. a TPM, uh, you know, in some cases for some of the versions we put out where we have uh, additional RAM slots. So we've uh, started to gain more leverage into that space. That's all the way up through version three. Our version four of our laptop that we're going to come out with probably late this year mm -hmm. uh, will be from schematics on up with our own industrial design and mechanical design. Part of that is because we've just grown and been able to gain leverage so we can influence more of that change. Oh, okay. On the phone side, that is entirely us, mm. uh, meaning the- uh, All the way from yes, top to bottom, okay. From, from schematic to all the EE, all the ID, industrial design, all the MD, the mechanical design, uh, and all fabrication, PCBA, mm -hmm. right? Uh, everything. So we have worked with individual groups mm -hmm. uh, within mostly out, just outside of Shenzhen to do that fabrication. And so we've gone direct to each of those and, and we're managing that entire process. So that's that's on the phone side, which then also we get to then replicate for laptops uh, mm -hmm. to come back to say, you know, we have grown large enough where we don't need to leverage a shell, right. uh, you know, a case uh, from uh, the, uh, a public mold. Right? We can do our own because we have the uh, cash to do so. So that type of growth allows us to then leverage more and more up into that supply chain. Right, right, right. You mentioned kill switch. What, what is that? So we have in all of our devices a physical switch which actually severs the circuit of webcam and microphone together. Mm -hmm. And this is going to be in the, this is already in our laptops and this will be in the phone as well. And then we also have a hardware kill switch that severs Wi-Fi Bluetooth on laptops. We'll also have one on the phone. And then we're also going to have a third switch on the phone that severs all circuits. Uh, oh, sorry, all uh, sensors. Mm -hmm. So it severs the circuit of all the sensors that you can say, I want all my sensors off, which would be like a GPS, uh, okay. accelerometer, right? Uh, even light sensors. Uh, to um, And then you can end up toggling it back on if you want. And then you can individually select the ones you'd like to have off. Oh, wow. Right? And so then this removes an awful lot of these what were previously, let's say, theoretical threats, mm -hmm. but they move into an area that uh, there's more and more proof that some of these, you know, even an accelerometer can right. show certain um, uh, things that are, you know, privacy, you know, uh, let's say, uh, privacy issues that you could encounter. And so these theoretical threats are starting to move where now they're uh, actually being studied and tested. Right. And so what we want to do is be ahead of that curve and say that, hey, you know, you can toggle them off if you want to, if you're not using them or toggle them on through a switch mm -hmm. and then individually select them. So then we end up with uh, a, a device that is truly in your control and then you get to enable or disable the things right. that you'd like to do. Right. I mean, this is a cat and mouse game because uh, I, I do cover security a bit, not too much. And last year they were reproved that uh, researchers have been able to, uh, speakers can be converted to microphones. Yes, yes, right. Or just a few weeks ago, I wrote a story for Linux Pro Max and also where uh, even if you have an air gap computer, yep. it, it, it can be compromised mm -hmm. totally, you know, remotely. Mm -hmm. So Correct. it's a cat and mouse game. Well, it is. is yeah. uh, it is a cat and mouse game. But, uh, but there's also a couple of... Uh, you can take, yeah. Because that's, yeah. that's basically saying it's sort of binary. Right. And, it, and it is rather nuanced. So right. what we do is we look at all of the potential threats. And this was where uh, free software is the, cr is the crucial piece from a mm -hmm. software standpoint, meaning that if all the software is released and the source code is available for audit, then that cr that paves the way for the strongest security story. Right. Then on top of that, then we have the ability for nuanced control. So if someone wants to have an air-gapped machine, but then they say that, okay, we have a screen that could be, uh, you know, uh, remotely viewed, then they could look at, uh, you know, minimizing, basically reducing the threat surface as much as possible and then looking to solve that one case that they're trying to solve for. So with our hardware, uh, all from the laptops and as well as the phone, is that by releasing the schematics, uh, re releasing all of the uh, source code, then that puts the control into the hands of, let's say, a security researcher or a government that wants to completely secure devices or enterprises that mm -hmm. say, you know what, the IT team wants to make sure that it's 
locked down with their keys. Right. And all the employees make sure that they're utilizing the appropriate services, VPN, et cetera. Mm-hmm. And so they have the ability to mitigate and reduce their threat model down to whatever they are concerned about. And so that's the important piece about the cat and mouse game is that mm-hmm. if somebody's really concerned about turning speakers into a microphone, that they have the ability to uh, disable that. Right. Right. Um, and that's not going to be for everybody, but yeah. having a platform in which they can do it is actually quite powerful. But even if it's a cat and mouse game, at least you do have, <laughs> you are chasing, you know, otherwise without these switches, you're just sitting, yeah, you know. Right. <laughs> right. So, so today, you know, the, all the phones, I mean, they're all Qualcomm or media tech based, uh, which is a concern to begin with, uh, where the base bands attach to the CPU, right? So the security story by definition there is mm-hmm. that it's going to be uh, that uh, I, the service providers have direct access to the CPU. Right. So this is where in our device, we by separating the two, then we can actually get to that point of uh, a really strong security story. What, what, when, when and why did you create Purism? What was the drive? What was the reason? So it's a, a lot of reasons. Uh, it has started, you know, kind of, let's say, you know, bubbling up for, for a decade as I, as I continue to go shop for new devices and I get frustrated by what's available out there. Um, I've been in the hardware and software space for a long time, a huge free software advocate. And so these things are, are concerns for me and have been for a while. Um, a big catalyst for me was uh, having kids. And I have two young daughters and looking at the future of computing and where things were going. Mm-hmm. And, you know, me as an individual, and I think this is a, a, the case for a lot of people, uh, especially pre-kids, right, that you're thinking about yourself. So I was willing to give up convenience mm. for my control. But then looking at seeing, uh, you know, having kids and then looking at the peer pressures, mm. devices, how they're just... You know, there's no IoT device that that is actually respects the user's rights. Uh, there's really nothing out there from phones at all. Laptops are also a concern. And what I wanted to do was actually say, you know what, I can change the future for other people, mm-hmm. not just for myself. And so that, to me, was where I, said, I thought, I'll open up that idea and see if, uh, if there's others that are interested. And I know that I have the drive and knowledge and ability mm-hmm. to execute in that space and have the passion toward it. Uh, and that's when I put out the crowdfunding campaign to see if other people would in, were interested in, in uh, you know, have pu- starting purism basically. Yeah, and that worked. Yeah. yeah yes. Right. Very well. Uh, from 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 uh, after talking to you, what I see is that you you focus too much on you know that the company should be ethical. You know, you should be doing the right thing. Um, but at time at, at at times, you know, people do make wrong choices. You know, as we talked sure. about with. Mm-hmm. Uh, do you think that, I mean, look at the airlines industry, okay, when, when you board a plane, you know it's safe because not because you trust the company. I don't even, most of the time, I don't even know it's Boeing plane or Airbus, it's actually it's just like Android and Apple, you know, yes. Boeing or, you know, uh, Airbus. At the same time, uh, but what I do trust is that there are regulations, you know, there are laws. Do you think that, lo- you know, uh, regulations can also play a big role in ensuring, like Europe, you know, GDPR is out. Yes, yeah. So what do you think about US? What role I, can... Uh, So I I think your analogy is actually fantastic because uh, it does show that I talk about these two worlds that we have, the physical world where we have centuries of physical rights. And in the digital world, we don't have any. Mm -hmm. And so I do, I'm very strong believer that Mm -hmm. we should have digital rights and those digital rights should be founded off of what benefits people in the society. And so these are things that uh, when I was looking at, right, should I be more of an activist? Mm-hmm. Right? Um, I already have been an activist for decades and it's an education process, mm-hmm. right? And what I have to do is, as an example is I have to educate people to say, let's to take your analogy, say, no, you shouldn't fly uh, that, you know, let's say Boeing but, airplane, but yeah, yeah. right? Instead, you should fly a different airplane. And then you would come back to me and say, yeah, but that doesn't get me from point A to point B. Right. And I say, and my activist stance would say, yes, but you're giving up your rights right, right. to participate. So the, taking the analogy of saying that that flying and there was no regulations would actually be a sort of this unethical approach if we apply that to that analogy. So taking that same analogy forward would be that in the digital rights world, right, we have barely anything, right? Um, so what, what has happened in Europe is a step in the right direction. Uh, but people need to be comfortable that when they just 
quote unquote board the plane, that they know that that the regulations are there to protect them. And mm-hmm. that's why it's one of the safest forms of travel. That's why people are comfortable in getting on. And so that same type of thing could happen with devices and the internet and digital rights. And this comes comes all the way from you know anti-bullying mm-hmm. uh, all the way through to uh, just general you having all of your privacy rights protected. As society advances mm-hmm. more and more toward uh, you know where our online life is going to be more than our physical life, mm-hmm. that these are going to be real concerns that, right. that need to be addressed. So what I looked at doing was uh, I'm going to both be an activist uh, as well as, well, I guess three things, activist as well as work towards lobbying to make sure that regulations can be in place and then also provide a business that can uh, create a business that has the ability for creating products that can actually solve these problems as well. And by doing that, then uh, I can influence, maximize my influence on the future of computing. Uh, so you have been doing laptop for, you know, ages. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, you know, there is, a, as you said, there's a good, you know, market, there is a good user base. But, but, what about phone, you know? Building a phone, you know, hardware and software is challenging, but, yes. but the main thing is getting people to use it. Yes. So what is your strategy towards applications? Uh, so it's similar to forming a strong beachhead and then expanding. So what we actually, we know that we are not going to have uh, all of the applications to compete head to head with Android right. day one uh, or iOS. And so what we're, what we're doing is we're taking an approach and have a business model behind it that allows us for incremental growth. Okay. So uh, that approach allows us to put out a product, right, that focuses on just the core applications that are needed for secure and encrypted communication. Mm-hmm. So you can imagine enterprise that just simply are like, I need to be able to open up a browser, check my email, uh, communicate, message, make phone calls. And that's the core that, that they need mm-hmm. uh, and individuals need. And that's the primary focus of what we're delivering. We actually are shipping around 350 development kits to active developers who are going to be advancing certain uh, features. We've already heard from some of them already okay. before we even have the dev kits out that are working off of our uh, development documentation okay. uh, and emulators. So we can start to see that that's going to then expand. So if you look back on you know some other businesses that kind of took this incremental approach and are now you know, world dominating. Would be, Can you give an example? Yeah, it would be Apple. So mm-hmm. Apple is a prime example where initially they were very, very focused on, let's say, the creatives and uh, graphics designers. Yeah, and that's so what, they, yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. so they formed a very, very strong beachhead. Now, they also made really great quality product. And then, as you, if, if I'm sure you remember, uh, that, you know, initially the concern back then was, well, I can't get, you know, my Microsoft Word to run on the Mac. And, and so it was a evolutionary change to get to that point where now you can do everything that you would like to do on a, you know, on an Apple device. And so what we need to do is solve the same exact problems and take the same incremental approach. And so that's what, and then, ta- and then the difference for us is of course, we're doing it uh, uh, by forming a strong beachhead by doing so ethically. And then we can advance to say, hey, you know, we're putting out okay. high quality products. Mm-hmm. We focus on an initial core set of applications that know that it can sell hardware. Mm-hmm. And then we can uh, have a community of developers who all believe and have believed, right? This is, this is you know, decades of building up this, the free software world who can then just immediately port things to an application and a hardware application that they believe in. So it takes it, so our app, app store, Right, which is really going to be just a repository mm-hmm. of applications, will continue to grow. Right, and and taking an approach that at any point in time we are selling hardware, have enough margin to to continue to grow, then that means that we actually will influence change. Right, we're not going to be a flash in the pan or burn up or anything else. Right, we're taking a approach of solving a problem that needs to be solved five years from now and ten years from now. And that is a business model decision, mm-hmm. uh, which is counter to a lot of Silicon Valley type of businesses where it's uh, a quick hit and cash out and who cares what happens. Right. right? Uh, and that's, so that's another reason why I get that question a lot. Right? It's almost like you have to have 10,000 apps or else you're going to fail as opposed to thinking, well, actually, let's just take a, an incremental approach and it's a marathon, not a sprint. 
but if uh, you mentioned Apple, um, but Apple had a very, you know, first of all, oh, there are a couple of things that were interesting in Apple's case. One was that, you, as you said, they targeted graphic artists and stuff. Graphic art, uh, or, or, you know, these kind of professionals, they also spend a lot of money on their hardware. I mean, I, I also have, you know, very high-end machine, you know, do. and I love that system. Mm -hmm. So, first of all, there is a revenue model, you know, it's, a, mm -hmm. it's, it's for the users who are willing to throw money. Yep. <coughs> Versus uh, a lot of people in the open source community, sometimes they, they think that free software means free of cost software, so they're not willing to pay for it, number one. Number two is that Google Chrome is a good use case where they targeted a very niche audience. There was, there was nothing, you know, with Chrome you get to do less that you can do on your, you know, Linux machine, but it succeeded, it's working. So what is your, I'm sorry, I take a lot of time to build the foundation, you know, sorry. so that there is a context, you know. So what is your core audience? First of all, who's willing to pay? Mm -hmm. And second is that there's a niche that, you know, whatever you're offering, they're happy with that. And, you know, even if they don't get word for two years, they don't mind. Mm -hmm. So there's uh, kind of two parts to that uh, question. The, f the first piece is that uh, everybody understands you have to pay for hardware mm -hmm. uh, because it's a physical good. And so by having a business model that sells hardware and, uh, and services and you know, releases everything under free software and has an ethical approach even at our, you know, in our uh, articles of incorporation, then we uh, gain the respect and the community behind what I very strongly believe in. So that's uh, one key piece is that everybody understands you have to pay for hardware. So a phone, they, you understand you have to pay for the hardware of a phone. So that means we have a business model that can actually compete against the giants, as opposed to, let's say, uh, f just simply a free software right. service where you're trying to take it in on donations. Mm -hmm. right? That will never have the financial leverage to compete against the giants. Right. So you just, by definition, are relegated to the people who care mm -hmm. about th those topics, which is going to be a smaller market. Right. So, um, so that's the, the first part. The second part is by forming a really strong a very, very strong core audience who are dedicated to advancing and solving this problem, yet having a business model that can actually compete, right? I have, I can stand on solid ground and point at uh, Google and Apple and Microsoft and Facebook and everybody else in that C Corp world uh, and, and say that's not the best approach that's going to help users. And by having that major differentiator, they're all going to all of those in the C-Corp world will market like crazy that they protect your privacy or we've modified our privacy right. rights or right because they see that the pendulum swinging away away from there. Mm -hmm. so, so it's going to be a lot of marketing heavy um, that we're going to be competing with. But by having such a strong, solid base that for them to actually compete head to head, uh, they would need to release all their software, uh, actually change their corporation status to something that actually is meaningful for the social good. Uh, and so that gives us a, di a major differentiator where we can continue to, to grow and, and influence change. And then this also gets to the point of when you're bringing up Chrome OS, the areas that they've seen success is an area that we would be able to target down the line uh, because we can get uh, to lower cost uh, products as well. The last point that I think you raised was um, about graphics designers willing to pay, uh, meaning to pay for a premium. So we sell high quality hardware and a premium, and and we already are selling and seeing a growth mm -hmm. in that space. And that's because we don't just focus on uh, only free software advocates. Free software is the core for the areas of privacy rights and the areas of security. So security is a huge area that we've seen growth in. These are uh, CTOs, CIOs, CSOs, who all sit in a room with your executives. Mm -hmm. And the executives will have a story of, we can't have a major data breach, right? right? Because major data breaches are, can, can be company threatening. And so they're tasking the technical people to say, we need to lock down our devices, right? We need to lock down our customer service devices, right? Because they have access to all the customer data. So how do we go about doing that? And purism continues to pop up mm -hmm. as the means because we actually just recently announced our tamper evident uh, laptops, mm -hmm. which means a single bit change can be flagged as, hey, that's been modified. So it means it can uh, flag to any type of ransomware or malware or any uh, remote uh, uh, access trojan that kind of tries to hit the system. So being able to advance that security story 
also uh, helps with enterprise. And as you can imagine, enterprise sales uh, is a huge area with security. So this all gets back to while we care about ethics, ethics and free software is the nucleus mm -hmm. and sort of that uh, foundation for to have a credible story in security. Anybody else, right? Say if someone's trying to make a security based Android phone, right? In the security world, they just get laughed out of the room, right? Because it's so hard to make, uh, to actually lock that down. Um, which is also why security firms, even if they're using Android now, are looking to have it be on our hardware, uh, where they can just swap out the Android and put in a Linux kernel, but still use whatever system they have on top. Be that, let's like, say like uh, uh, Elo or even Copperhead or right these other types of things. Uh, Ubuntu Touch is another example, right? Where it's currently an Android core, but that can get swapped out mm -hmm. on our hardware with a with a Linux kernel, and then uh, and then we can actually advance that security story tremendously. Right. Yeah. I mean, so yeah, that's what I. Used to, there should be some core audience, mm -hmm. and then you can expand beyond that because that's, that's right. what. You, because I don't think it, you can really target everybody because right. it's, it's so, really hard. So we have a pretty clear business plan right, to, right. to begin with, which was. Uh, we do. We want to have a product that can reach everybody. Reach everybody, but we, but but we know uh, unless we went out and raised hundreds of millions, of dollars, right, right, uh, that we wouldn't be able to solve all of those problems and hit that and hit that entire market day one. Right. We knew we had to increment there, and so the approach we took, uh, which is you know pretty simple, based off of my entire belief system of saying let's target security, privacy, and freedom. Mm -hmm. The nucleus of that, of course, is free software. Mm -hmm. uh, and the more that we can make available and transparent, the stronger the security story. That has a really strong business model. And the beachhead we've already formed and are already starting to expand in is uh, is around those three pillars. Right. right. Privacy, security, and freedom. And then what happens is the, the audience beyond that, because you realize these are also the, the tastemakers. These are the influencers. Right? CTOs, CIOs, CSOs, software developers. These are the people who the average users will be asking, what mm -hmm. phone should I get? Mm -hmm. right? What laptop should I get? Right? You probably get asked that regularly. Mm -hmm. And so you provide the recommendation based off of you know, what's gonna be the best for that individual. And if, they, if you start to see that, oh, well, I can provide a Librem laptop or a Librem 5 phone, and they can do everything they want to, but mm -hmm. they're completely protected, that's a huge market mm -hmm. and huge amount of difference that we can make. The last point I'll make there is that we actually have seen uh, interest, growing amount of interest from parents, mm -hmm. which is actually why one of the reasons I started Purism was to say phones should respect the individuals and respect the kids in this case. And so parents who are trying to figure out the you know future of computing and what you know online bullying and social media and what can they provide their kid and how much data is being gathered on their child uh, as a parent. And provider, it's a growing concern, and you, as you can imagine, that market is starting to uh, is starting to grow for us, which is one that I would consider consider well outside the core, right? Uh, and these, the, so those are some examples of where we'll start to see kind of these uh, uh, large areas of growth down the beach, and then we'll start to you know advance into into the let's say into the city of average users. Do you remember a few weeks ago Facebook announced Facebook for kids, children, children? Uh, I'm they're, not. I'm not yeah, something. Yeah, some, it was like criticized, but it was for for kids also. You know, something. Oh, you like, know, I do think I, yeah, I remember yeah. hearing about that. Uh, yeah. Just uh, very briefly. And uh, I mean, and to be honest, I mean, I I don't want to contradict you, but uh, there are a lot of people, you know, who 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 themselves are not tech savvy. Yeah, that's right. Uh, they're intimidated, so they are willing to hand hand over those kind of mm -hmm. toys to their kids because when their kids play with that, they feel that their kid is a techie. Mm -hmm. If you can swipe an app on your iPhone mm -hmm. or iPad, mm -hmm. oh, my te kid is a techie. So, so I, don't, I don't think that contradicts, well, I think that if anything, that bolsters what I'm no, saying. No, sometimes so. the parents, you know, uh, there are, uh, I mean, parents who are aware, but at the same yes. time, there are a lot of parents who are not aware of the privacy risk. Oh, I, and they, right. And I, so I think that. VTech toys, you know, they get VTech toys and they're infamous for, you know, they have webcams in their toys and they're stealing all the, not a stealing, but nobody's yeah, paying right. attention to yeah. security. So it was getting harvested. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, so. so yeah. I, so I, I agree with you, and yes. I think that what what you're highlighting mm -hmm. is the long term story. Exactly, is that what we need to do is make it where ethical products are seen as the comparable, right? Right. So just as easy to use, but but 
fully respect your rights. And so then an individual, right? And so yes, Facebook can come out with Facebook for kids or they could come out with but secure Facebook or mm -hmm. whatever they try to market. And like mm -hmm. I said, it's all just marketing. And of course they have billions to spend mm -hmm. on marketing and trying to change that influence. But at the end of the day, the, a lot of people, and we don't even need the majority, but we just need a lot of people to start to be made aware. That, right. You know what? That's uh, still a C corporation. Their entire business model is yes. to extract as much information about you as possible and exploit you as an individual. And that is that cannot change unless it's a systemic change from Facebook, which is not going to happen until they start to see a huge decline and realize how can we survive. Right. Uh, and I also believe that will happen mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, because it's just so easy to switch, uh, even when they have all your data locked up. To the data before, right, the stickiness of a user was uh, stickier a decade ago. Now, so much data is just temporary mm -hmm. that the ability to switch to something else is so much easier now. Mm -hmm. And that uh, that also has the giants, you know, scared. Right. So the the long term future. I think is by providing something that's, and we can, you know, stand on solid ground to say what we're actually doing is protecting mm -hmm. the individual mm -hmm. and making sure the user is in control, and the, in this case, right. the child is in control, or the parents are in control of their family if they want to, right? and uh, and that allows for, uh, uh, you know, the people who, let's say, are in the know, these people who recommend mm -hmm. devices. So let's say if you go. Talk to a school counselor. The mm -hmm. school counselor says, "Hey, we should use this product." Mm -hmm. um, that will start to be introduced more and more into that conversation, and then uh, people can start making educated decisions. And I actually believe that uh, the this, as I described, this overall pendulum has swung it was so far to the right of digital rights invasion that as it's swinging back, mm -hmm. we get to be seen and pointed to as the opposite end of that. Right, and so. If the pendulum swings all the way back to center, we'll be completely happy uh, because we'll at least then users will have a choice. If it right. swings farther, all the way back to let's say f the far left side of that pendulum, where we have solid regulation, in you know to help uh, making sure that users who don't know that they you know that they all their private private data you know can't be retained for a long time. D data retention policies, right, uh, and other types of uh, mm -hmm. regulation that would be smart. Mm -hmm. And, and the, the most interesting thing is, uh, as I was talking to Richard Stallman, and we actually discussed before that also the telling that don't use this device because I mean, as you said, you know, just make that sacrifice, you know, mm -hmm. don't 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 board on plane. But here at least you are creating an option. Mm -hmm. So even if there is a drive to to make people aware. So you can, just the way we tell our kids, you know, okay, you can either take a shower or a bath. We're not saying, do you want to take a shower or not? You know, right. it's just, so, it's, so it's, there is at least an option. Yes. And that option is also not uh, really the poorly written option where, okay, you will have to make so many compromises to use it. It's fully, you know, full blown option. That's so right. if you want, That's right. if there's an awareness drive or if there are regulations, yes. So there is something that people can go back to. Yeah, that's right. So at the same time, I also feel that it's kind of also future proofing in a way that if push comes to shove and people do need, I mean, I was watching Black Mirror, you know, and yes, the yes. extreme cases are there. Mm -hmm. So people, if they do want, there is an option. Mm -hmm. They won't have to unplug themselves right. from the matrix. Yes, that's right. So uh, you're, you're highlighting two really important parts about purism. So. Mm -hmm. We stand for convenience mm -hmm. and control. Mm -hmm. So what we do is we provide convenient products that give the user control. And that uh, hasn't been done before. And so by us doing that means that if you have a convenient option, then then all of the advocates, which I am one of them, mm -hmm. can then say, can point to that and say, actually right. here, I'll just hand you a phone, use this, and then you can go, great, I can now participate in digital society but I can do so where I know that I have peace of mind that I'm, you know, not being a product or being, you know, manipulated, uh, and I have control. And so the this analogy that I like to provide about advancing toward, let's say, right, you know, right now we have these devices that are external to us, and then pretty soon it'll be we start. We're starting to already read some internal like biometrics, and then it'll start to get embedded, right? And so we can actually control, right? Let's say your heart, and you know, so monitoring it. Um, there's already devices that can, that are computers, right? That can, uh, uh, you know, provide an electrical shock to your heart, and so these are things that, as we advance, 
and technology, these are going to get closer and closer and closer to our brain. And so I asked the theoretical question that in the future, when you can choose a brain embeddable device that can be surgically implanted and it can read and write the electrical signals of your brain, which means it can read and write your thoughts and it can, uh, you know, insert memories, right? Record everything from, you know, your optics. Uh, who would, you, what company would you like that to come from? Right? Would that be Google, Facebook, Microsoft, Apple? Right? The list is none of those because they're all C corporations which are going to try and maximize profit, maximize shareholder value, which means to uh, try and you know, utilize the, everything they can uh, and insert whatever they can into your brain. And, uh, and purism as a social purpose corporation has the ability to say we would have you control your own brain. Mm -hmm. So the difference is it does come down to control. The future corporations are all going to be vying to control the user more and more and more uh, and we're going to fight against it and we're, but the primary way in which we can succeed is by making the products convenient. And so your example of saying that uh, you know, you could give up some convenience, or you could choose uh, ways you brought up, like Richard Stallman, who stated, you know, I, I just choose not to use it. Mm -hmm. right? Individually, that's what I choose as mm -hmm. well. Right? I choose not to use services that uh, exploit me. So I, if I have to read a terms of service, I will not sign up for the service. Uh, or create a sock puppet account or something uh, to temporarily use that service. And so uh, that's inconvenient. <laughs> so I choose to be inconvenienced, and I don't think that everybody should. Mm -hmm. And so that's, uh, again, back to having kids and seeing the future, that we need to have easy-to-use products that are convenient, but then that gives control back to the individual so that they uh, aren't manipulated. You, you, you keep saying C-sharp, but let's, there are some companies, like Red Hat, for mm -hmm. example. It's a C-sharp, uh, C-corp. Yeah. Uh, they're not kind of evil, uh, per se. Uh, mm -hmm. Um, uh, while I do agree, I agree with your mm -hmm. thoughts, pro, pro, you know, fully mm -hmm. that you know those companies, their their primary goal is to you know kind of. Yes, mm -hmm. But at the same time, you know, there are companies that may be. Oh, sure, it doesn't by definition mean you're a, a bad corporation. You're a bad corp um, I, I mean, as a matter of fact, purism. For, yes. we could be a C corporation and, and, and still be good. Yes, and my belief system yeah. would be the thing that carries it. So in the case of Red Hat, um, you know that they have made a lot of. I mean, there's some really amazing advancements. I know a bunch of people at Red Hat um, and, you know, with speci specifically with uh, Gnome Foundation mm -hmm. and a bunch of other advancements. So Red Hat, I don't put into that camp right, of, exactly. of being a, uh, you know, malicious, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, across the board as I do right, all those other right. examples. But that's because, uh, not because that they're, uh, you know, a C-Corp, it's because of their management exactly, yeah, and, you know, other things that, that they have done that at least are trending in the right direction. Um, and so the other piece is that also they have a business model. Right? Which has nothing to do with, yeah. It has nothing to do with data gathering, right? Mm -hmm. It's simply a subscription. So there's plenty of businesses that, uh, you know, let's say fall outside when you're outside of data. Right. Uh, and you're outside of services. Mm -hmm. And you're providing, in their case, you know, business to business licenses for, you know, uh, software. And then they contribute back right. to the free software world. Right. That's, that's a perfectly fine business. And also they don't, they're not put in a position. Uh, but let's just say that they, if if they were put in a position where they could install a backdoor and it would maximize shareholder value, their board of directors and the executives uh, would have to look at those two and say, well, you know, g being paid to put in a backdoor maximizes shareholder value. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we have to, we have a fiduciary duty to do so. Mm -hmm. So uh, they could then try and weigh the ethics of it. But in the end of the day, shareholders could sue them for not maximizing their shareholder value and that's a real threat. I mean that happens, right? That's not a theoretical threat that happens. And so 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 purism, why why we formed as a social purpose corporation is so then all investors, any shareholders, anybody involved as executive level, the board of directors, we all have to look at the ethics first. Right. And say what's going to benefit users mm -hmm. and their digital rights mm -hmm. first and foremost. And in our case if we're given that choice, backdoor or not, we would, we would have to. We have a fiduciary duty, actually, to avoid right. uh, putting in any backdoor, even if it were to increase our revenue, mm -hmm. uh, because it, it it's sort of this. The first litmus test is uh, digital rights for users. 
I will once again go back to the airplane analogy, mm -hmm. and that is that yes, their shareholders will want you know, but uh, to just put you know cheap food you know, or just mm -hmm. get food from you know China or Mexico or India you know, yes. mm -hmm. but they can't do that you know because there are laws and you know regulations, and there will be massive fines you know that they will go to business. Yep. So so while it is nice to have one purism, mm -hmm. but there can't be. And at the same time, on the other side of the spectrum, it's nice to have Red Hat. Mm -hmm. But in this space, as you mentioned earlier, the point that, you know, the reason I asked was that uh, I just wanted to stress the point that you made earlier, that we need the same kind of rights in digital world also. Yes, I agree so, exactly. so, so we, sh we just need, you know, just the way we have road science and traffic science and all those laws. We right. need the same thing. I mean, that will ensure it doesn't matter whether you're a social purpose corporation or C corporation. Right. So, so, so that will where... also, you know, mm -hmm. kind of, they can't do, even if you want, even no matter if you're Google or Facebook, you just can't because law doesn't allow. Mm -hmm. So, so I th this is where I believe that there's a number of th uh, three pronged approach that I take. Mm -hmm. so personally, I advocate. You for, yes, you have been right? doing uh, it for a long time. And I uh, and so that's part number one, right? The advocates out there are great. Mm -hmm. The second piece is I do believe that we should have digital laws mm -hmm. that respect the digital world uh, because it crosses over to the physical world, and so in the physical world, right. We've had so many centuries of laws and precedent, right. and we can take a lot of those laws and precedent and apply them to the, the physical world, which mm -hmm. you know includes law enforcement being made aware of of that if somebody calls up. I give the analogy of if you put a, a physical camera on your kitchen mm -hmm. and a kitchen window, right? Or excuse me, somebody else comes up and puts a physical camera on the kitchen window, and you're in the room and you see that some there's a camera spying on your kitchen you would immediately call the authorities and the authorities would come out and say oh look at somebody was trespassing uh, there was a you know a camera put in which is you know peeping tom laws and mm -hmm. and then they take that so you'd have a criminal case opened mm -hmm. it would possible that they would be arrested if they could find who the individual was and uh you know uh charges would be pressed right so it would the whole process would would come full circle in the digital world you're carrying around a camera that can be lit up anytime by anybody involved in the tech tech stack, be that from you know Google to the ISP to and your microphone and and there's and your data. You just by signing a terms of service, you've agreed to give everything to Facebook, right, or Uber or whomever, right. And so you by signing a terms of service, you just give it all up. And you're willing to, you're not going to read the terms of service. Most people don't. You can't, right? it's so and long. You're right, and you, you would never sign up for anything. And so then you end up, you know, you just basically accept, and then you use the service thinking it's good for you, you know, it's fine. And the reason you think that is because in the physical world, we have all these rights. In the digital world, you don't. And so they're just being exploited all over the place. So that second point is lobbying, right? To, And as purism grows, we'll actually be able to lobby and say, hey, you know what, we can, these are the things that we'd like to see. And then the first, the third piece of that is the being a uh, social purpose corporation means that we can stand on solid ground and, right. and point to saying, hey, we're doing it the, the right way. This is the way we'd like it to be for society. Mm -hmm. And so we can try to influence change by lobbying, but also we can influence change by just being what we'd like to see. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think we, we kind of covered a broad, we talked for almost an hour and we covered a broad range of topics yes, about, yeah. you know, the company, the purism, and we also talked about kind of, you know, ideal society mm -hmm. where not only uh, people like you, we need more, you know, entrepreneurs like you mm -hmm. who, have, who are driving that kind of business model, plus maybe uh, some help from the <laughs> administration and governments also yes, to make sure. laws. Yes, mm -hmm. But uh, awareness also plays a big role where people themselves are aware of for what sure. is the right thing. So I think we covered a broad range of topic. And once yes. again, you know, thanks for you know coming over and you know chatting today. Oh, no, I, I really appreciate it. And yeah, thank it's been you fantastic. so much. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Yep.